those just didn't gel with my writing style. Now, I again, I love reading that stuff, but it really did not gel with my writing style. And I think that might be, you know, one lesson that that writers can take from from this as well. Just because you enjoy reading something does not mean that that is where you are going to be a strong writer. I do think that you have to, when they say write what you know, you have to know the uh, the ins and outs of your genre. You have to know, for instance, that if you're going to be a romance writer, that you really need to have a happily ever after. But not just that, that there are many more expectations that your readers are going to have with that, that genre. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello and welcome to episode 309 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Paul Austin Ardoin, a USA Today bestselling indie author of the Fenway Stevenson Mysteries and the Woodhead Becker Mysteries. And we talk about these mysteries, we talk about his writing, and we talk a lot about his new book, Zero to Four Figures, Making $1,000 a Month Self-Publishing Fiction. And that is coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word from this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Let's hear from them. He's listening. She's listening. They're all searching for their next listen. Is your audiobook out there? If not, what's holding you back? After this, it won't be audiobook creation tools. Introducing Findaway Voices Marketplace, the audiobook creation platform built for a world booming with audiobooks. Voices Marketplace gives you a searchable and trusted space to connect with narrators, free production and business tools, and the power to bring your audiobooks to market quickly. We've heard everything you have asked and used that to build an audiobook creation platform for you. Plus, we give you access to the world's largest audiobook distribution network, reaching listeners through more than 40 retail and library partners. No exclusivity. You keep your rights. This is your audiobook creation platform. Ready to get started? Make it on Marketplace. And if you're looking for ways on how you can leverage Findaway Voices, including the Findaway Voices Marketplace, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And now for some comments from recent episodes. Over on Twitter, Edwin Downward said, The latest episode of Stark Reflections puts me in mind of how all writers need to remember the basics of why they write and to not let the perpetual advice machine get them off track with doing things that don't work for their particular skills and aims. Well, couldn't agree with you more, Edwin. Thanks for sharing that perspective. And it is something we have to remind ourselves of consistently because we are bombarded with so much advice and so many things to do and panicking that we're not doing at all. Now, in email, I received an email from Kathy Mack. And and so I think Kathy's one of my longtime listeners, and you may remember her from (laughs) several episodes of the podcast is a listener who batch listens to episodes over time, which I also do for, for many of the podcasts I listen to. So here's here's the email from Kathy, and I did get permission to quote this email. And thanks for including the permission in the PS from your email, Kathy. Kathy said, sorry I missed the chance to comment on your 300th episode. However, you had plenty of fans who expressed the very same congrats and gratitude that I would have. Everything I know about indie publishing I learned because of the Stark Reflections podcast Most of it I learned directly from the podcast, though sometimes your show notes sent me to another source. Regardless, all of it started with you. Thanks so much, Kathy. That's so great to know. 
because I do spend quite a bit of time putting the show notes together and trying to include links to additional resources. So glad you're able to take advantage of it and I appreciate the kind words. Kathy goes on to say, a couple of times in the past few months, you've mentioned that you have a Josie planner and I'll link to the episode where, where we talked about the Josie planner, um, but haven't put anything in it. And yes, that's true, Kathy. I still haven't. And it's the beginning of June already. Kathy says, well, I was one of the podcast patrons who won one of them, and I thought you'd like to see that it is being put to heavy use. So I've attached a photo of my May. And she says in parentheses, not much writing marked in it, but a bunch of other stuff. I go back and forth annually between an online and a hard copy calendar. And and yeah, the photo Kathy sent Wow, that calendar is being used in a major way. That is fantastic, Kathy. I'm so glad that you, unlike me, put it to really, really good use. So thank you for that. And over on Patreon, a couple of comments on the 12-hour walk, the special audio version that I released for patrons. Stanley B. Trice says... I enjoyed listening to your 12-hour walk, and I was not annoyed by the songs. I thought that was a great way to end that walk with you and Liz together. Uh, Thanks so much, Stanley. And what Stanley's talking about is I was a little bit worried that the podcast itself, uh, I used a lot of earworms, I used a lot of audio clips related to things I was talking about. You know, I mentioned Louis B. Armstrong's What a Wonderful World when I witnessed something that I walked by, and of course I... I played a clip from the song as well. And of course, if anyone knows me, I referenced Rush a few times and may have used some Rush music in that. Okay, so, and then uh, also on Patreon, Edwin Downward says, I had this playing in the background as I did a few light tasks at work. Lots of fascinating reflections. Your ending makes me think about the number of times I've tweeted out something along the lines of, playing in my head today, (laughs) dot, dot, dot. (laughs) Yeah, thanks, uh, Edwin. It, it's funny how songs can get stuck in our heads, isn't it? I mean, I, mean, I do love and, and, and sometimes hate the earworms, but there always seems to be some sort of musical bit going on in the back of my head, regardless of where I am, what I'm doing, what conversation I'm in. It just is just part of part of the essence of, of who I am. And every once in a while, like in that special episode, I kind of let it slip that, yeah, there was a song going through my head. Here, here's, a, here's a little sounder for you. <laughs> so I think it could probably get annoying if I just did that in my, in my commentary on the podcast all the time. Although I do, if you're a longtime listener, I do slip those in. So thank you so much for the comments, everyone. Thanks so much for all the great retweets I've received from so many different people as well about uh, episodes of the podcast. I love that you guys retweet that because it just helps other people find the podcast. It's another way you can help me, of course, is to share the podcast, share an episode, share your reflections on what you think, you know, the podcast, uh, what it meant to you, what you learned, what you were reflecting on. You can always tag me on places like Twitter, at Mark Leslie or at Mark Leslie Lafave on Instagram and other platforms. You can email me as well, mark at marklesley.ca or, you know, leave comments on on starkreflections.ca, etc. Now, uh, I, I mentioned patrons and I do want to, and I believe I've neglected to welcome a few new patrons that came in in the, in the past little while. And I'd love to welcome Lydia Q and Ryan from Plotter. So welcome, Lydia. Welcome, Ryan, for uh, being patrons of the podcast. Great to have you on board. If you're having any trouble accessing additional audio that's available for patrons or any of the other content, please do let me know. And a thank you to Lydia Q and Ryan from Plotter and everyone who supports this podcast over at patreon.com slash stark reflections. Well, I'm going to forego the personal update so we can get right in to this fantastic interview with Paul. Paul, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. It's great to be here, Mark. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm thrilled to to be able to talk uh, with you about your your new, hot new book for writers. But before we segue into that, I, I want to get into your background uh, as a writer. So you're a mystery writer, and that's right. Yeah is it has, has that always been your passion? It was 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 mystery story and stuff like that always a passion for you? 
You know, I, I have wanted, and I talk about this in, in my book, I've wanted to be a novelist ever since I was six years old. I always thought oh, really? I would be a novelist. Okay. Um, and I, uh, I even like drew my own book covers and, and stuff like that. And I, uh, I majored in creative writing when I went to university. Okay. Uh, but at university, it was all about literary fiction. And sometimes that's great. Um, but I realized uh, as I got older and older and hadn't finished my great American novel uh, yet that I loved reading mysteries when I was, even when I was little, reading the Encyclopedia Brown mysteries, reading Danny Dunn's Scientific Detective and that series. Uh, and I realized if I was going to become a novelist, uh, I needed to write something that I actually enjoyed writing. Uh, I really like reading literary fiction. Uh, but writing, I, I had read all, almost all the Agatha Christie novels when I was in junior high. Okay, I had kind of internalized uh, the the structure of mysteries, which is almost as as structured as romance novels. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and my wife gave me a really excellent idea for a main character. Um, she uh, was was thinking about perhaps becoming a nurse, and we were living in California at the time. And she said, you know. One of the things I could do with a nursing degree is I could become a county coroner in California. And so voila, my really? main character is a is a <laughs> former nurse who becomes a county coroner in California. There you go. And then you guys moved from California, right? That's right. We uh, we live in Milwaukee now, which okay. is uh, a, a lot colder, but uh, but also awesome. Well, you went to Milwaukee for the beer, right? I, uh, easily twenty percent of the reason why I moved was was for the the beer. Yeah, not not, not, not for the weather, though. not for the weather. <laughs> well, I you know we lived in Central California where it got really hot in the summer, so I can't say it wasn't entirely because of the of the cooler weather. But my kids both go to Marquette University here in Milwaukee, and so it oh, made it an easy decision for us to move. Oh yeah, I mean that that makes sense. But you you get a variety of weather in Milwaukee as opposed to just the heat, right? Right. There are seasons here, which is which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I could do without the four feet of snow, but uh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. So so is it's the series. Was it always gonna be a series featuring featuring that uh retired nurse come <laughs> county coroner? So when I wrote when I wrote the first uh book, I really just wanted to finish a book. I was in my uh, mid forties and I hadn't finished a novel yet. And that really? pesky six year old inside of me was like, when are you going to finish that novel? And so that was really my main goal, but I did leave it open-ended so that perhaps, you know, uh, it, there wasn't any plot device that prohibited a sequel. Okay. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe I could make this into a series. And then when, uh, when people started expressing interest in it, I thought I'd I'd make a second one. When people started asking me when I would write the second one, right. I uh, I thought it would become a series. So oh, wow. I'm on uh, I'm on eight books right now. I'll be starting the ninth one uh, uh, later in the year. So when did that? You said you were in your 40s when that first novel came out. When was that roughly in relation to 20 uh, spring of 2023? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was. Uh, on on Sunday, as we record this, it will have been five years since the publication date of The Reluctant Coroner, which is the first book in the series. So 2018. So, I can do math. I can do math. Yep. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> Every once in a while. And I, I have my, my shoes and socks off, so that's that's why I was able to do it properly. But <laughs> it was complicated math. I didn't just need one hand. I needed yeah. everything. So, <laughs> okay. So let's, let, I, I want to dig into this a little bit because... You were the six-year-old who was drawing book covers and dreaming about being an author. You even majored in creative writing. And then the first book didn't come out until you were uh, in your 40s. And I want to wonder, so so Paul, what happened? Did, 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 did the college experience beat the life out of your creative spirit or what happened? That that was part of it. Um, you know, I had a creative writing professor who absolutely detested Sue Grafton, and I hadn't actually read Sue Grafton okay. uh, yet. As a mystery reader, you would think she would have been really, really mm -hmm. up there on my list, but he detested her. And so for years, I thought she uh, was not somebody I should emulate. And then I read A is for Alibi again when I was in my early 40s, and I was like, 
I cannot believe I felt betrayed by my creative writing professor. So he doesn't uh, like so, anyone who writes a really successful story that millions of people have enjoyed. <laughs> it it was it was I what is there not to like about it except if you're you're jealous of Sue Grafton's success, I, I guess. And that was really one of the things that was like, well, maybe I should write mysteries. If 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 he was teaching me creative writing and he didn't like this, and I love I think it's obviously one of the the best series starters out there maybe i shouldn't listen to everything that my professors told me 20 years ago in 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 college when and you know this the same thing with sci-fi and all genre fictions they thought the world began and ended with literary fiction right. uh, and they you know anything that was sci-fi fantasy romance especially they turned their up their noses at and and I think that's very common in university settings. Yeah, yeah, of course. And so, so what were you said? You said you read the uh, A's for Alibi finally when you were in your early forties, and there was an aha moment there. But was there something else that prompted you to to actually finish? Because you had you talked about other unfinished novels. Yeah, I think uh, so. I'm I am what is commonly referred to as a pantser or a discovery writer. And mm -hmm. when with my unfinished novels, I would write myself into a corner. Uh, because literary fiction, a lot of the stories are a little bit thin on plot. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them are very character driven. Yeah. Um, there are some that that aren't that that have uh, that have very strong plots, but quite a few of them are rather episodic, and those just didn't gel with my writing style. Oh. Now, I again, I love reading that that stuff. I'm not super plot driven as a as a reader. Right. Uh, but it really did not gel with my writing style. Uh, and I think that might be, you know, one lesson that, that writers can take from, from this as well, just because you enjoy reading something does not mean that that is where you are going to be a strong writer. Right. I do think that you have to, when they say, write what, you know, you have to know the, uh, the ins and outs of your genre. You have to know for instance, that if you're going to be a romance writer, that you really need to have a happily ever after. But not just that, that there are many more expectations that your readers are going to have right. with that that genre. Um, you, you, I, I talk about this a little bit, too, because I, I dipped my toe into the romance uh, novel writing pool uh, for, for a year or so. And I did not know the genre well enough uh, I, it was a it was a happily ever after ending, but I made some really huge mistakes where uh, my readership was like, I don't even want to pick that book up because it what it it broke a bunch of the expectations for mm -hmm. what people wanted out of uh, romance books. Yeah, like there's a certain it's like a roller coaster ride. Like you expect certain things. And you know you're gonna yeah. you're gonna come out safe at the end, <laughs> but there's all this the anticipation and the thrill and the twists and stuff like that. Uh, no, but I want to get I want to get back into the fact that you talk about being a, a discovery writer or a pantser, and yet you're writing mm -hmm. mysteries. And oftentimes I've always been under the impression that well, no, no, you know exactly what the solution is, and then you un you kind of tangle it all up and try to confuse the reader, and you plant all these things. But wait, when you when you start off, like, is there a dead body, and then you don't know who did it or how they did it or anything like that? So I almost always, well, in fact, I do always. Who did it? I know. Uh, I I know why the murder was uh, okay. was was performed why okay. um right but i don't know how the sleuth is going to figure out who killed the oh, victim okay. and sometimes i don't know who else is going to end up dead okay. there are a few books i have where there is more than one murder okay and and all of the things that happen um th that happen between there that's that's what i don't know and there are times when I have been writing and the sleuth is definitely aiming for this one suspect who I thought was the murderer all the time. And I've gotten a hundred pages from the end and gone, oh, wait a second. That's not the murderer. This other person is the murderer. It's only happened to me a couple of times. And I think that's one of the uh, pitfalls of pantsing a mystery novel. Right. Um, there are uh, There are authors out there who 
start with a dead body and don't know who committed the uh, the crime. And I think that's a recipe for a lot of rewriting, which is fine if that's yeah. your process. Right. right. Um, and there are definitely times when I have had to go back and add what I call breadcrumbs uh, to make sure that that a a reader who is paying attention can definitely solve the mystery if they're paying close enough attention and if they put the right two and two together, right. which is, you know, that's one of the unwritten rules of, of murder mysteries is that a reader who is paying close enough attention has to be able to solve it. Uh, you have to give the, the reader the same clues that the sleuth sees on the page. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think what you were describing when you thought somebody had committed the murder, but then as you were, writing the story you realized it was someone else because probably you had been planting things all the way along and went wait a second it makes more sense now that it would be that person so exactly that's a yeah. that's that is exactly what happened yeah uh, and it and it made for a really uh in in my opinion made for a really effective red herring yeah because the you, because you, if i was even going going this I was way. writing it yeah <laughs> i love that you fooled yourself <laughs> so Oh, that's fantastic. That is fantastic. But but apart from and, and you've got a couple different uh, mystery series, uh, different different characters that, that you've been writing about. But you is this is this book we're, we're going to be talking about? Is this is this the first nonfiction book for writers that you've put out? Yes, this is the first nonfiction book for writers that I put out a couple months ago. I had a, an article published in Indie Author magazine. And uh, but this is the first time I've I've uh, I've written a nonfiction book for writers. I've made a lot of mistakes in the last five years of my author career, uh, and I've done a lot of things right. And I I think that uh, that sharing my experience, I, I hope, will help a lot of, of other authors out there. Oh, awesome. Awesome. So so let's let's talk about the book. Let's talk about zero to four figures of making a thousand dollars a month self-publishing fiction. Now. Is it is it really possible to make a thousand dollars a month self publishing fiction, or is this a is this a mystery you're going to unravel for us? <laughs> so there is a definite plan that I believe that many authors can put in place. Um, now every author's journey is different, so uh, I'm using my experience as a template for right. this. Okay, but I really believe that following these ideas and this mindset is a way that that authors out there, whether they publish a novel every month or they publish one or two novels a year, can get to a thousand dollars a month in a year or two or three, depending on depending on their genre, depending on how quickly they write and a host of other things. Now, I, I've noticed a lot of the when I was starting my author journey, a lot of the books that I was reading were things like your first 10,000 fans. Uh, and a lot of the books were really pushing the, you can quit your day job, you can buy a house in the Bahamas, look at all of these successful indie publishers who have done it. Um, and there are, you know, a handful of them and, uh, and there are a handful more every year. But it was very quickly overwhelming because there were there were so many pieces of the puzzle to put together and it was really difficult to know okay i'm really starting from you know my my friends and family have have bought my books and i know they're good because people are calling me up and go you know i bought it because i'm your friend but it's actually decent i i <laughs> might buy the second one <laughs> and i mean and i'm serious i'm well thank you for buying it but I'm really glad that that you know it was a pity buy that <laughs> it turns into <laughs> into something that people want to read. And I, I think I think there are a lot of authors who have a very similar experience to that, but they don't know where to go. They've sold fifty dollars worth of books their first month, and then you know they've run out of of friends and family after that. And and so where do they go? So I'm focusing on first of all a, a mindset shift and talking a little bit about the sorts of books that that authors who are serious about writing should write. Right, okay. Serious about an author career should write. Secondly, thinking about the first book that they want to get in readers' hands in a different way. Really thinking about that book like an advertisement and then building their marketing strategy 
around that first book and how they're going to get that into readers' hands. Okay. And once they've done that, and once there are other books that they have that the that the author has for sale, whether it's two books, three books, five books, that's where an author can build uh, their readership. That's how they can uh, build their following. And that's how they can get to $1,000 a month. So I'm curious to dig into that because, you know, over the years, talking to various indie authors and even, you know, traditionally published authors, there was sort of a, a rule of thumb, an unspoken and sometimes spoken rule of thumb that, yeah, it's it's really not until the third book is out or the fourth book is out in a series, usually not doesn't have to be, but that's easier path of least resistance for binge readers that that's usually where the magic starts to happen. Is that something that you noticed as well in your studies? Oh, absolutely. I mean, now writers are not always, they don't always follow the same patterns that the majority of readers out there follow. But I'm sure that you and I have both been in a situation where we're like, what should I read now? And then we have to go onto a website or we go into a bookstore and we wander around until we find something that we think we're going to like, and then we buy it. And if it is the first book in a series and we wind up liking it, we are not going to end that book and go, I wonder what I should read now. What we're going to do is read book two in that series. And it doesn't really matter if it's one of those, uh, if it has a cliffhanger at, at the end or if it's one of those series of standalones like the Becky Chambers Wayfarer series, uh, you know, if it's just set in the same universe with maybe one or two characters that appear in each of each of the books, if the if we think you know this is the same author, it's set in the same world, I think I'm going to like this because I liked book one in the series. It and it's such a sense of relief as a reader right. to purchase to to know that. Yeah, I'm probably going to like this next book because I, I've liked everything else in the series so far. And even when you're like, yeah, that was sort of a missed book four was sort of a misstep, but I bet they'll get back on track with number five. It, it's, you know, it, it's not, it's definitely when you're making the, the purchase decision for a book, it's much easier to buy that book five, even if book four was a little bit disappointing because you've liked books one through three, than yeah. to put everything down and go, I'm going to go on another search for a book that I don't know whether or not I'll like. <laughs> yeah, at least you're like, yeah, okay, it was one meal was off, but I'm, I'll, I'll, we'll give the kitchen another shot. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's definitely human nature when, when we do this. And I know there are a lot of authors out there who don't like reading in series, and so they don't like writing in series. I have talked to a bunch of author friends who get bored with one genre uh, or or one series and and write standalones because of that. And I'm not saying you can't be successful doing that, but you're you can be a lot more successful. You it's it's the path of least resistance to put something out there that will attract the reader to your next book. Yeah. And it's much easier writing your next book when it's a continuation of something you've already written. Again, it doesn't have to be, you know, a direct sequel. It can be uh, a connected standalones as, mm -hmm. uh, as it's called. Uh, but that's so much easier to convince a reader to buy it when you do that. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Of course. You've already got that pay that that's already a path that's paved. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm impressed and pleased that, your you talk about in the book you talk about expectations as a writer and i and i really want to hammer this home because a lot of times like you said it's like oh you can be a millionaire writer and everyone's buying a yacht and all the things you know we were joking about before we began the interview and you put which is is it, it's still a lot of work and it's not easy to achieve but it's an achievable goal because a thousand dollars a month from your fiction is twelve thousand dollars a year now the Authors Guild and a whole bunch of surveys from traditionally published authors show that the average traditionally published author makes $8,000 a year. So, you know, it's doable to get to $12,000. It's, 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 it's a lot. And, and there's a lot of authors I know who still have not yet cracked three figures a month, for example, in terms of what they're making. And it, I, I just want to say, yeah, it's hard. It's not always easy. But what I love about 
your book is you set an expectation that, yeah, this is a admirable goal, but it's still reachable as opposed to that, you know, five figures a month and the six figures a year and the seven figures and stuff like that. So I think one of the things that I appreciate about, about you writing this book is that you're creating a reachable, realistic target that, of course, once you get there, it's probably easier to get to that next phase. Is this like a milestone that authors can look at? Well, I, I hope so. I, I've definitely set it up because there are so many books out there that are focused on on the higher levels and people feel so overwhelmed by all of the stuff that they have to do. Um, I, I'm I'm suggesting tools that don't cost a lot. Now, you know, just like any business, an author business requires a little bit of investment at the beginning. Right. It's it's not something that many people can put zero dollars in and and be successful. And but I am suggesting like two hundred dollars a month, not okay. spending twenty thousand dollars a month on a Amazon ads. Right. Um, okay. So I, I do think that that it is it is, it is a stepping stone, but it's also something I think a lot more people would be hopeful about it if if their hobby of writing books and all of the time and effort they put into it and all of the blood, sweat and tears, if it pays for itself, yeah. if it, if they're not sinking their own money into getting their books in front of their, their readers, if, if it's a, if it's a, a self-funding platform that they're, that they're on, I think that makes a world of difference in terms of how we as authors view what, what we do. You have to love writing if you're going to be doing this and if you're going to be serious about it. And it's so nice when you don't have to spend the money from your day job to fund, um, to fund what you're doing in your spare time. Right. Right. All right. I love that. So you, you start off the book with uh, expectations as a writer, but then you, you just instantly go right to a critical element that we don't often think about is that expectations for the reader. Now you talked about that earlier in this conversation with the, you know, the, the, the tropes and the expectations for romance and mystery and that there's certain beats that, that the reader's looking for. They're looking for, I used to call like the Big Mac experience where no matter where they go, they order a Big Mac or, or they order a romance or they order a mystery. They know that there's certain things or certain flavors they're going to get. Right. Ab absolutely. And, I think one of the biggest uh, missteps that that authors early in their career make is they put together a book that is that they think is unique, that defies genre. And they can often point to this as a uh, they're proud that they have put something in there that defies genre. Um, and that often leads to books that are very difficult for readers to find and very difficult for readers to make that purchase decision because again they don't really know what they're going to get um you know we we used a restaurant analogy earlier you know if if the chef has a bad night well if you've been there a few times before you give the kitchen another chance if you are driving along the the road and you are hungry and you see a greek restaurant you know what you're you're going to get. You know what your expectation should be when you go into the Greek restaurant. But if you see something that has the flags up from 30 different countries in, in front and it says, you know, tacos and piroshkis and, um, and injera, uh, it's very difficult for, you know, and unless somebody's really looking for Oh, I I love Mexican and Ethiopian combined. Um, <laughs> it's going to be really difficult to get people to stop at at that restaurant. And the same thing with with your book. If they look at your cover, if they look at the description, and if they can't figure out what kind of book they're getting, uh, they're they're first of all they're they're probably not going to buy it. But if they do buy it, and they're they thought it was the wrong kind of book. They're not going to be pleased about that. Right. Um, and in fact, I talk about a mistake that I made um, with my second uh, mystery series uh, here, where I created the cover as an homage to another uh, designer that had a lot. There were a lot of Easter eggs in this book series uh, uh, about uh, 
uh, about this. And it turned out that the the book cover looked a lot more like a nonfiction book than mm-hmm. like a hard boiled murder mystery. And I actually had to go, I, I went through another, a redesign and it turns out that that one, yeah, it looked a little better, but it looked more like a dystopian uh, thriller than like a hard boiled murder mystery. And I finally re- got it redesigned uh, so that it looked like a hard boiled murder mystery. And finally the sales started, uh, started coming up uh, right. to it. And now I can only imagine how much better my sales would have been if I had started that series with the cover that I ended up with instead of instead of going down the road where I was not setting my readers expectations properly well it it's and it sounded like you made you made an error you corrected it and then you corrected the correction like you didn't stop you didn't stop learning you didn't stop trying you didn't stop finding the right thing you you share a lot of mistakes that you've made in in the book i i believe i've shared pretty much all of the mistakes that i've <laughs> that i've made in the book in my in my author career there are many more that i've made in life that shall that shall remain uh, of course <laughs> unshared yeah, yeah. that parking um, ticket between you and <laughs> the state or the city i, I talk a I talk a lot about that romance series that uh, okay. was, I, I call it a fiasco because uh, I was so far apart on my reader expectations that I, I pretty much abandoned the series. Uh, I was able to save my second series because I was, I, I knew what changes needed to be made. And I didn't think, I didn't think the book itself was far off from reader expectations. I thought the way I had marketed it and I consider book covers and book descriptions part of the marketing effort uh okay. with that that what was, was that's what was off uh, on that series oh wow well. and, and you you briefly mentioned earlier um marketing and promotions and and looking at you know realistic expectations not twenty thousand dollars a month that you're spending on it but maybe two hundred dollars a month now you have a whole chapter on marketing and a whole other chapter on promotions uh, can you talk a little bit about like the value of of what, what's the, what? How do you differentiate the two and and the value of of what that can be? Well, promotions is one of the core pillars of of a successful marketing strategy. Um, and I I do have an MBA in marketing, so I I sort of know what I'm talking about as much as any MBA <laughs> uh, does. And I I've had some early readers on this who are like, yeah, you should tone down the marketing stuff because i went to sleep in it so uh i've i've re i've reworked it a little bit so it's you just put so much in it right you're like <laughs> right right yeah let's not put the entire mba program uh yeah. in there so part of it is is taking a step back and thinking about how your readers are going to not only find your book but want to read your book and then want to continue reading the rest of your books okay. that's really what successful book marketing boils down to is being able to put yourself into your reader's shoes with that. Right. Now, the question of how how they're going to find your books, there are many questions about marketing in there. Are you going to go into Kindle Unlimited, into the KDP Select program, or are you going to go wide? Uh, how do you think your, your readers are going to find you there? And if you decide to go that direction, then how are you going to drive readers to to Kindle, uh, or how are you going to drive readers to those wide storefronts? Uh, these are these are all questions that, unfortunately, a lot of authors have to answer before they really understand everything that's at, at stake uh, here. And I, I hope that you know there are a, a couple of chapters that that talk about that. So I, I hope that new authors can have a little better footing when they go forward with this. And then with the promotions, it's all about getting your book. Your, your, the first book that you want readers to see from you that hopefully will make them go, yeah, this author's great. I want to buy the rest of their stuff. That first book is really, it's, it's, it's an advertisement. You know, you'll go into um, big box stores like Costco and they've got, they've got samples of food you can eat, right? And if you like that taste of, the grilled sausage or the the shot of wheatgrass or whatever, maybe you'll buy the whole bag or the whole box or, or whatever. It's a very similar strategy to that. 
And your first book is that taste, that first taste of your writing that you're giving to people who, who are coming by. Then you have to figure out where is my Costco? You have to figure out how you're going to get that that book that you have in front of customers so that they will try it out. Now, it doesn't have to be uh, free first in series is a very common marketing approach. It's the one that, that worked for me. It doesn't work for every author out there. Sometimes they do 99 cent first in series. Sometimes they do 299. Sometimes it'll be a full price one and they can figure out how uh, how that becomes successful with them. But the, the whole idea is this is the entry point novel. And this is that is what I have to get in front of my audience. Okay. So you're focusing on that item, not advertising the big bag of of you know pre-cooked sausages, <laughs> but just getting getting that sample in front of uh, the right people rather than worrying about and let let that sample take care of getting them into the bag, right? A absolutely. I mean, I, certainly for connected standalones and a lot of romance authors write connected standalones and they are able to you know, promote any book in their series and have the read through go from book six to book one to book four to book book two. Mm -hmm. um, now, I write I write a series in which you pretty much have to read book one first and then book two, three, four. Right. Um, so it's very clear to me what book I need to be promoting. Yeah, people can start in the middle, but it's a lot more satisfying to most readers to start with book one. And so book one is what I promote. Okay. And I promoted it at, at first uh, with with book funnel and story origin when, well, story origin wasn't around five years ago, but right. um, but I started promoting it with that. And that's how I built, you know, book funnel and story origin both. Get this book for free. All you need to do is sign up for my newsletter. And from that newsletter, yeah, you get a bunch of of, of uh, freebie chasers in there, but you also get a, a not insignificant number of people who like the book that you wrote and will buy that. And if you don't, if you don't use something cheap like Book Funnel or Story Origin to get that that book to be your Costco. Um, you know, at Costco, there are a whole bunch of people who are like, yeah, that's how I'm going to get lunch. I'm going to go around to all of the, the free <laughs> sample uh, plates. Yeah. But they're still there because there is a not significant number of people who are like, oh, I like that. I'm going to buy the bag. Yeah. And that's your audience. It, the, 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 the freebie seekers, it's part of the business. Yeah. And it's not like your ebook costs you anything to distribute anyway. Right. Okay, fair enough. I like that. <laughs> so you you kind of wrap up the book. You have a putting it all together. You've got this um, timeline, and you probably used your own example mm -hmm. for a timeline, but that's just to give people an idea of what happens at different stages. Can can you talk through that just a little bit? Yeah. So I assume that um, that as a fairly new writer, you've got probably two or three books in your collection and your uh, in your in your your catalog and you're frustrated with the low number of sales that, that you've had. So that's the starting point for this. And that's where, that's where I was when I started, uh, started this, I had, you know, my mom and uh, three of my work friends in my newsletter list. And that was, and that was it. So this really starts with figure out, first of all, figure out if not that entry point novel really works and edit it or rewrite or do whatever you have to do so that you can figure out, yes, this is going to appeal to readers of this genre. I need to change my book cover because it's not appealing to readers of that genre. It doesn't look like anything else in, in that genre. I, I need to, and you know, those are difficult conversations to have with yourself because nobody wants, you know, especially your first book, very precious. And thinking about that first book like an advertisement and not like your precious baby is is really the first step um, here. So once you've got that that done, then you can use an inexpensive marketing tool like book, book funnel or story origin. You can start to build your um, your newsletter. Um, your your newsletter is one of the most important marketing tools that you have because that's how you can stay connected to the people who have downloaded your first book and bought your second book so that they know when the third book, the fourth book, the fifth book comes out and, and for sale. And again, if they liked your first two books, 
they're going to be much more likely to buy your third and your fourth and your fifth right. in, in the series. And that's one of the reasons why you want to have something like a newsletter so that you can you can keep going. And, and a newsletter is not super expensive. Even the most expensive ones are 50 or $60 a month. And they're not even that expensive when you're, when you're first starting out and you only have, you know, one or 200 people in your, in your mailing uh, list. And then from there, you can build the interest in your books. And then when you have enough capital and enough books created um, that it makes sense for you to start actually spending more money to advertise that an entry point novel, then you can, then you can do that. And I talk about book promotion sites uh, out there. I talk a little bit about advertising, but if you're not making a thousand dollars a month yet, advertising is probably not where you want to be spending uh, your money. So, uh, you know, I, I talk a lot about that uh, as well, where you want to be spending your money as an author who, who's just starting out, because, you know, it's very easy to be convinced that you want to spend a thousand dollars on, on, uh, on an Amazon ad campaign um, right. when really that's that's not going to put you where you want to be. It might in two or three years when you're making fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars a month, but not when you're making fifty or a hundred dollars a month. Right, right. Wow. So I have to ask this because this is your first nonfiction book where you're taking a bunch of your experience as a writer and trying to help other writers. What's one or two of the elements that you made sure that you included in this book that you felt were lacking in the industry in general like hey i'm there's a there's a gap in the market there's there's advice that's not being shared it's not whatever it was is there are there there are, are there a few things like that 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 you wanted to make sure your book had that you didn't see out there yeah absolutely so i think one of the things that i didn't see out there was there wasn't any there weren't any books that targeted people who were this early in their author career okay. um there there isn't I don't see another book out there right now that says, here's how you get to a thousand dollars. I see okay. some that are much, the, the dreams that they promise are much more grandiose. Yeah. Second of all, I didn't see a lot of books that combined what you need to do with your, with your craft and, and how to target the audience with your craft and pairing that with your marketing strategy. Okay. Uh, there's there's a a lot of stuff out there that says first of all make sure you have the best book you can write, and that isn't that's sort of skipping a step. So I really wanted to make sure that we were that I got that step out there, and I I made it clear where I think authors have to be in their their the books that they write in order to be successful. And then the third thing, and possibly one of the, the more important things that I didn't see out there was an attitude towards the entry point novel. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen it called an entry point novel uh, anywhere else. But thinking about that first book that you've written or the first book in your series or the first book in your, your world, not as the thing that you spent 10 years of your life lovingly creating and and crying over every changed word in the, the third paragraph i mean we've all been there with our with our first books and i'm not um making fun of that process as somebody who took eight years to write that first that first novel i've been there yeah. but i couldn't think of it as as my precious little baby if i wanted to have a successful author career because it was it was just too too close to me emotionally if you start thinking about it like an advertisement and stop thinking about it like this is my flagship product that is going to carry my author business. It, I think that mind shift is really helpful. It really helped me anyway, because it made me realize that, first of all, it's not perfect. It's a first novel, but it's good enough. And, and I also talk about the changes that I had to make to it before it became the successful advertisement that it, that it, uh, that it became. If you start thinking about it like that, that really frees you up to think about your author business in uh, in a way that I think can make you a lot more successful than heavily guarding um, your book as if, if as if you're Gollum protecting the, the ring. <laughs> I love that. I love that. 
Paul, what is one bit of advice that you would have loved to have had uh, when you were, you know, beginning that that author journey? Well, you know, a lot of people told me that I wasn't going to get rich off off my book or even close to it. And I suppose I, I was like, yeah, but that's for other people. I could be the next Paula Hawkins. <laughs> And, and it, it it really it really did not set my writer expectations you know it, well I, I also think if somebody had had said to me you know these are these are books that can be changed that's one of the great things about being a self-publisher you can change stuff there there isn't there isn't some some publishing outfit out there that's like well, you know, we tried, but I guess it's not going to it's not going to work and you can't change anything. And yeah, it looks like the title didn't work. And yeah, it looks like we designed the book cover wrong. Too bad if you design your book cover wrong. If you it, you can rewrite your entire book, you can change the title, you can change everything about it if you have made a mistake and you can do it like that. I mean, you know, the rewriting and the redesigning takes time. But it's something that once you know what needs to be changed and once you have everything that needs to be changed, you can go on to Amazon or Kobo or Barnes and Noble and make those changes and they'll be up within 72 hours. And that yeah. is magic. Yeah. I wish somebody had told me about that because I, I, I think I, I probably would have published a lot sooner than five years ago right. if, I had, if I had realized the power of, of being able to make changes. That's cool. Awesome. Paul, can you please let my uh, listeners know where they can find out more about you online as well as this uh, this new book? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, my book is called From Zero to Four Figures. It's available for pre-order and it will be released on June 13th and all the major resellers, Amazon, Kobo, Barnes & Noble, uh, Google, Apple, uh, and more. You can go to my website at paulaustinardwan.com. That's A-R-D-O-I-N.com. Um, you can, that's the same author address as my mystery series. Uh, and I have uh, both the nonfiction and the fiction uh, links up there to my books. Awesome. Well, Paul, thanks for writing this new book. Uh, thanks for taking the time to share advice with me today as well. Thanks very much for having me on, Mark. Appreciate it. Just a few things that I want to reflect on. The first is, I guess it's it's the importance of writing the types of genres and stories that speak to you and that you're passionate about sharing. And, and, and of course, within that, understanding the genre, understanding the tropes, the expectations of the readers of those tropes is a very important element of getting that book right. I think the other thing that I want to reflect on as well is, and this reflects back to something that Liz said, uh, my partner Liz said in episode 301 when she was just talking about a reader reminding this thing of writers. And this is when, when Paul talks about the value of reading a series uh, or an author that you already know, rather than the frustrating process from the reader's perspective of, oh my God, what am I going to read next? Finding something new. It's so much easier just to know, I love this author, I'm going to read their other book, or I'm going to just read the next book in the series. It's just, it, it, it removes that resistance. It removes that friction in a significant way, which is why multiple books, multiple books in, in the same universe or et cetera, works so well for so many authors. And finally, so important that we always forget, is just remembering just how easy it is as, as an indie author to be able to change, to adjust, to revise. You can make mistakes. I've, I've done that myself with uh, A Canadian Werewolf New York, for example, when it first published in 2016. I had the wrong cover. I, I had a cover that would probably appeal to a more literary audience because I didn't think there was enough werewolf and, you know, fantastical elements in it to appeal to the readers of urban fantasy. I and, and it definitely didn't appeal to a literary audience. So I completely missed the mark on that, which is why when I revised the cover in 2020, and that was part of branding for the whole series, 
but when I revised the cover in 2020, I sold more copies in the first six of 2020 than I probably sold in, in the previous four years. And that's because I made a mistake. I corrected it years later, but I could correct it. And I've, I've continued to adjust and make corrections along the way. Including, you know, the typos that nobody ever spots. None of the readers, none of the proofreaders, none of the editors spotted. That always, always happens to us. But we have the ability to fix those things. So I would love to hear what you thought, what some of your reflections are of this book. This uh, episode is releasing on Friday, June 9th. uh, But the book is coming out in just a few days. And it is a fantastic book. I am going to reread that. And it's probably a book I'm going to have to remind myself of. Yes, Paul was writing it for writers at a particular spot in their career. But the fundamentals he's teaching, even if you are making more than $1,000 a month, the fundamentals he teaches are so important to remind yourself of. Little things like that book is not just your baby, but it is uh, it is your advertising tool in so many ways. And, and I've never heard anyone say it like that. So if you have reflections, I'd love to hear them over at starkreflections.ca. You can at me on Twitter at Mark Leslie. Email me, mark at markleslie.ca. I want to thank you so much for listening to the podcast. And a reminder, if you like this podcast, love this interview, please feel free to share it with someone that you think is going to get some value from it. And that's the end of this episode. So as always, until next week, And next episode, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.